Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of the Yard. Hope you're well today. Hope it's a payday for you as you make your way to start before Super Bowl Dark Weekend. Got a lot to talk about. Going to preview the Auburn series and talk a little bit about what to expect uh, in the spring game. Also got an, a great top 10 list. And I mean great. Man, it's been so much fun putting this together. It's been tough, but it's been fun. Today was an easy list, though, to be honest with you. It really has been. I, I think the new blood in rock and roll is really good. But uh, we're going to talk about that, obviously. And, um, yeah, of course, uh, a lot of things going on as we uh, as we get into the end of spring practice and really in the in the meat of the SEC schedule. And so update you on some things around that. Let me go ahead and tell you now. No, I don't expect Nate Dome to pitch this weekend. If you watched Due to Fact last night, we did talk about that. A lot of people are curious. And when we do get him back, He's not going to be the same guy he was for a while. So you need to understand that hopefully we have him back for the stretch run. Yeah, it's, it's concerning. It is. But, uh, you know, we have to soldier on. Simple as that. We have to soldier on. And uh, so, uh, great weekend coming up with uh, Auburn in town. We have to take full advantage of this weekend, as you guys are well aware. Last place team in the league, they're probably better than a record indicates. And I'm not saying that to kind of you know lay the groundwork if we uh, lose we, that we shouldn't. Uh, we certainly should win this series. We need to sweep. We have to take two. Uh, that's as simple as I can put it. But uh, let's get right to it. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of the show. And i tell you this, if you're looking for a place to eat that everybody in the family is going to enjoy, you're not going to find a better place than Bulldog Burger Company. I mean, how many times do you take your kids to a white tablecloth restaurant? They just order chicken tenders, right? Uh, if you're going to do that, you know, make everybody happy, just go to Bulldog Burger Company. You can get that great BLT salad, which is my favorite, probably the best salad I've ever eaten in my life. I like it grilled. You may like it fried. Uh, recently had those uh, bacon ranch chicken sliders. Outstanding. Great lunch portion, too. But the reason you go to Bulldog Burger Company is for the burgers, the great restaurant-quality hamburgers that are available to you there. They're unavailable anywhere else. If you're a newbie, the Bulldog Burger Company. Let me advise you, just get the Bulldog. You can't beat it. It's a great, straight-ahead, rock-and-roll American hamburger. Get it how you want it. You may like it with onions. I don't. But I'm not going to sit here and uh, and force you to eat like I do. I'm just going to encourage you to go out there and find something you like, as you will. There's so many great options to choose from on the Bulldog Burger Company menu. Always some cool specials, too. Be sure and ask about that, you know. Uh, but uh, get the spring rolls as your appetizer. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. We need to make the world a more beautiful place every chance we get. And get dessert to go, man. I, I like that Nutella shake, but sometimes I kind of shake it up and get whatever the, the weekly special is. It's pretty cool. Years ago, I kind of talked them into doing the uh, the banana the banana split deal. You know when, when McNamee and those guys made the run and Westy had the uh, the lucky banana? Yeah, so they do some things like that that are somewhat timely. So always be sure and check before you make your order that there might not be something else that um, may be there for limited time that kind of suits your fancy. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Guys, this show has become synonymous with Bulldog Burger Company, and I'm happy about that because what a great place to work, a great place to dine. It's a company that has some integrity that has served the Golden Triangle so well for so many years. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right, let's break down the Auburn Tigers here. It has been a challenging year. You know, they were ranked early in the year, and a lot of people thought, you know what, hey, this is a team. You know, if a couple things go right, they might be able to make a run in the postseason, potentially get to Omaha. It hasn't worked out, at least not yet. They're now 2-13 and 13 in the conference. You know, so you're three SEC losses away from being assured of a losing record, and you got five weekends to play. Just 2-13. and 13. We have to take advantage of this. Auburn 19-17 and 17 overall. It's all started out, you know, kind of well enough. Uh, they sweep the series with Eastern Kentucky. The first game of the year was a 10-run roll deal, a mercy killing in seven innings. And then they bounce back and this allow one run in, in the uh, second third game of the series as they sweep. They host UAB after that to take that. Iowa, they go down and play in the, the Jacks College Baseball Classic and have a good showing. I mean, Iowa's ranked 18th in the country. Auburn beats them 17-5 down in Jacksonville. They mercy kill Wichita State. It's amazing how uh, Wichita State, you know, when I was a kid, Wichita State was like the team that everybody aspired to be when Gene Stevenson was there. And, of course, they scheduled like 100 games every year. It's true. It's true. 
But the Shockers were like, hey, that's the, that's the class of college baseball. It's amazing how things have changed generation to generation. Uh, the first loss of the year comes against the number 10 ranked, you know, Virginia Cavaliers down in Jacksonville, but it's a 6-4 ball game. So there was a lot of optimism about Auburn baseball. It's like, hey, you know, we're right here playing with everybody, even playing some ranked teams and kind of validating people's preseason hype about us. Sanford rolls into Auburn and gets spanked 12 to 3. UConn goes in and uh, they take the middle game there, which was uh, the second game of a Saturday doubleheader. But Auburn wins 8 1 8 2 in their two games. And so, again, even though it's UConn, you want to win your home series, right? They cancel a uh, midweek game against Air Force and play on Wednesday, win that game 8 4. Austin P. Goes in there for a weekend series and takes the middle game, but Auburn gets uh, you know Friday and Sunday, and that Sunday game was absolutely gaudy—a twenty-four to five game. Kind of stunk a little bit, but when when Austin P won that middle game, we're thinking, you know what? Maybe that's not as bad a loss as we thought. No, it is. It is. Don't delude yourselves, Bulldog fans. We should have won both of those games against Austin P. Absolutely should have. Uh, Troy. Plays Auburn down at uh, Madison, Alabama, Toyota Field, and, and Auburn wins that game too. And so you get an SEC play, and you, right here you're thinking, okay, this Auburn team's pretty good. They're pretty good. And they're 13-3 and three at the time, ranked 12th in the country. And you're like, you know what, hey, these guys are going to live up to the preseason expectations. And then they get swept by Vanderbilt in Nashville. And these games, for the most part, weren't competitive until you got into Sunday. Auburn gets 10-run ruled on Friday. And then loses 13 to 5 on Saturday. And now you're thinking, man, Vanderbilt must be a monster. Now, knowing what we know now, we look back and say, you know what? That probably wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Auburn, again, uh, again, the Sunday game is a 9 6 game, but they're losers again. Well, they bounce back and they get South Alabama down in Montgomery at Riverwalk Stadium. And they win the game 2 to 1. You know, we've been in that, we've been in a situation too. We played South out a neutral side game down in the South. They have some fans come in. And uh, of course, we, we give them the ball game. But we'll lose a one-run game. Then Auburn heads to Arkansas. And right now, you, you got to think if you're Butch Thompson, and you're not, but if you, if you are Butch Thompson, you're thinking, you know what, hey, I got Arkansas coming in, number one ranked team in the country, and uh, we've already been swept on the road. we got to bounce back here. We have to bounce back here. And, guys, that Thursday game, they lose one nothing. And so, yeah, you're pitching it well. But the offense can't come through. And, of course, that's Hagen Smith out there on the mound, too, for Arkansas. Legit dude. You come back on Friday, and it's another one-run loss. Now you're 0-5 in the SEC, and you start thinking, man, what a hole we're in already. They do get that Saturday game, so you salvage something. But, man, you hate to just take one on a home series, no matter if it is Arkansas. But, again, now you're 1-5 in the SEC, and you start thinking, man, this is brutal. But you did open up at Vandy and you host Arkansas. Those two teams were in top 10. They bounce back in the midweek game, take care of Jacksonville State 13 to 3. And then you got to go ahead and the college station. Brutal, man. The current number one team in the country now. They were number four back then. And again, these games were competitive. AM wins 9 7, 12 8, 10 9 in 12 innings. And you think, hey, Auburn gave a good fight. Yeah, they're one and eight now in the conference. And so these things are stacking up. And we've talked about it on the show even back then. It's like, this is a hole that's difficult to kind of get out of. Well, you bounce back in the midweek and you take care of Alabama. Then you host Tennessee, who at that time was ranked number four in the country. We talked about how brutal our schedule was to open the month of SEC play. You go back and look in hindsight at this, this Auburn team. Goodness gracious, man. Four teams in a top ten. Brutal. Well, Auburn gets the first game. They beat Tennessee 9-5. to And then Tennessee and Tony Vitello bounce back with back-to-back mercy killings in Plainsman Park. Absolutely brutal. 12-2, 19-5. Auburn pitching just hasn't lived up to what the people expected. And that's surprising. It really is because you know what a great pitching coach Butch is. And I can promise you nobody's more frustrated about that than him. It's true. But, again, you start digging through this and you're thinking, man, can Auburn dig their way out of this? Well, the burden of expectations is difficult, a difficult thing to carry. And Auburn really hit a low here with Alabama State going into Plainson Park and winning 3-2. to two. And you start thinking, man, this, things are not well 
at Auburn. Well, then Nick Mangion rolls in with Kentucky, who is now suddenly ranking the top ten too. So things aren't getting any easier. And, of course, Kentucky now leads the Southeastern Conference. Not Arkansas, Kentucky. I expected the Kentucky to be pretty good last year. I said, hey, these guys are getting a regional nickel, save his job, things will be okay. Didn't think Kentucky was going to be what they've proven to be this year. And I keep waiting. I said, you know, at some point, you know, everybody can get got, right? At some point, somebody will get Kentucky. But it is clear that they are playing with an edge. They go into Auburn and they sweep the series. 6-5, another one-run loss for Auburn. And then 9-1 to on Friday, and then Kentucky takes the series and sweeps it 13-8. to Absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. So now you're 2-13 and in the league. Uh, on Tuesday, Auburn played Georgia Tech, and that, it's interesting to get a Power 5 team in a midweek game, especially to come to your park, and Auburn scores eight in the first, as we discussed on Wednesday's show, and they, they go on to win 12-8. to eight. So that's where things sit right now from a schedule standpoint. And so, again, you go back and you look here. Guys, we're the first SEC team that Auburn's going to play this year that's not ranked, and we were ranked up until this week. And so – I think it's important to look at as bad as things have gone for Auburn, they are not a bad team. They've been unlucky a little bit at times. They haven't executed at times. This is a team that's not devoid of talent, though. This is not we're just going to be able to show up this weekend. We've got to have an intensity. We've got to be ready to go because Auburn is going to come in here fighting for their lives. And I won't be surprised if we drop a game. Again, I'm expecting State to take the series, but we really need to sweep. We could somehow get a sweep. All of a sudden, everybody's like, okay, hey, now we're 10-8 and eight with four weekends to play. We're in a great situation here. You get at least one each weekend. You're certainly excited about the potential of getting into the, the tournament. Uh, but let's, let's say you sweep this weekend. The next thing you know, you, let's say you take two next weekend, as you expect. Now, all of a sudden, you really put yourself in a good position. And, again, I know we're still kind of shake, shaking through the sting of last weekend, but that weekend is now behind us. Bulldogs cannot afford to let that linger. Let's get a little deeper into the numbers here with Auburn. Again, it's just amazing to me. I look up, and you see that 2-13, and 13, last place in the conference. It's, and again, you know, the schedule's been brutal, man. It absolutely has been. So anybody expecting this to be a walk in the park this weekend is probably setting themselves up for disappointment. We're going to have to play. Now, the kid that killed us last year really was the key to them winning that Sunday game. And ultimately, the series at Auburn is Cooper McMurray, who's had a really good year for Auburn. He's hitting 362. He's got 12 tanks, 48 RBI. And again, this is a lineup that's been kind of up and down, but he has been a constant for them. Ike Irish is a guy last year. John Cohen and Wes, uh, excuse me, Wes. And Butch Thompson both told me this is a guy we're really excited about. He's hitting 344. Got 11 tanks, 47 RBIs. He is a very polished hitter. Chase rate is really, really good. He's just not a guy that's going to give you a whole lot. You're going to have to get him out. And State did a really good job against him last year. But um, a lot of people think he has potential to be a big leaguer. Now, one of the things that just jumps out to me, it's just a gaudy stat. I mean, it's really, really, you look at it and say, hey, it's pretty good. And then other guys are like, wow. Cooper Weiss is hitting 307. Started every game, got 127 ABs, which is uh, tied with McMurray for, for most on the team. He's a... Uh, you know, got five tanks, 29 ribby. What, what jumps out here, guys? 25 of 29 on stolen bases. That's just ridiculous in this day and time. It's nuts. And so that's a guy you're going to have to watch, number two. And, again, uh, really solid on base percentage for him, too. You know, he's a guy that's willing to take a walk. Matter of fact, he's been walked 29 times, which leads the team. And based on his proficiency to steal bases, it's basically a double, Right. You put him on base, he's going to take second. He's been hit by the pitch three times, too. So that's 32 free passes on the year in addition to the 39 hits he's had. That's 71 times this guy's getting on base, not even counting, reaching on an error. You got to keep him off the base path, for sure. Definitely a threat to steal. Uh, Mason Manners, 306 average, and again, four of the regulars hitting above 300. And again, offensively, you look at these numbers and say, you know what, this is a pretty decent team, right? And then you flash to the record. And you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't calculate. This doesn't make sense. And, again, a lot of it's a quality of competition they faced in SEC play. Chris Tamfield's a guy we saw last year hitting 274, got a couple of tanks, 
But again, you get through these, these four in the order, there's not a lot behind them. There's just not a lot of depth. It really, really, really curves downward when you get in the bottom half of that order. I mean, it really is. I mean, like, again, Chris Danfield's hitting 274. The next regular is hitting 231. Uh, Bobby Pierce is a guy that had a big swing against us last year, too, hitting 224. This hasn't worked out quite the way they hoped. But, uh, listen, they're a team that can hit the long ball, too. They've hit 61 tanks. They've allowed 61 tanks. But as a team, they're hitting 279. And, again, we talk about stolen bases. And, and Johnny Long hasn't thrown anybody out this year. Now, a lot of that, too, is because we're holding pitchers. But um, they are going to attempt to run the bases. 61 of 69 is a team this year. So it's not just a one-man show. They're being very opportunistic, and they're base doing opportunities. And, uh, and, and you, just, you run the numbers here. I mean, it's like of the guys that have been caught stealing, like everybody that has been caught stealing has been caught once, with the exception of Weiss, who's had four. And 29 attempts. It's nuts. You, you want to be able to be about 80% stolen bases. Auburn is setting a really good standard there. So, again, we expect them to try to take the extra base. The one thing that helps is that, um, you know, Coach Parker has done such a great job uh, calling the pickoffs. You know, we still lead the SEC in, uh, in pickoffs. And so, again, that negates some of the opportunities you have to throw runners out. I don't care who gets the credit. I just want the out. But, again, if you're expecting this Auburn lineup just to kind of show up and just say, you know, our season's over, now we're going to get their best shot. We got to be prepared. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Let's look at the pitching numbers here. It's been uh, it's been a, it's been a wild year. As a staff, six twelve is an ERA. That's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. I mean, I mean, hey, compared to the numbers we put up last year, it, it feels like Cy Young quality. But uh, it has not been great by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, you start working through innings pitched here. You know, Chase Alsup is a guy that leads a team. With 41 innings pitched, but I tell you what, this hits per inning ratio is terrible. 55 hits. And you'd like to be one, uh, you know, a hit or less an inning. Guy's giving up 55, which enables people to kind of bunch things together. And he hasn't really helped himself missing bats either. He's allowed 12 and home 12 home runs this year. But opponents hitting 316. So yeah, he's a workhorse guy, but he struggled to keep the ball down. Now, he didn't walk a ton of people. Uh, just 12 on the year, and striking out about one per at 43. So right at four to one strikeout to walk ratio, but the extra base hits have just come in bunches. He's allowed a team high 13 doubles, and he's got a triple thrown in. So 36 extra base hits of the 55. So this is a guy you ought to be able to get some gap on. ERA of 7.46, and again, this is a guy that's got eight starts under his belt. He's got a one and three record, made nine appearances on the year. But uh, a guy that just has not performed up to expectations. He's clearly a competitor. He's willing to kind of grind through it and challenge hitters. But uh, something's just not quite right there. Uh, Carson Myers, a guy that, uh, that, that we've seen too. Car- Carson Myers, a guy with 4.13 ERA, nine appearances on the year, five starts, uh, two and three on the year. And he's a guy, again, 32 and two-thirds of an inning, allowing right at a hit per 34. Just 15 runs, 24 Ks against 18 walks. That's not a great ratio there at all. And, again, another guy that's been somewhat susceptible to long ball, out of five tanks, Connor McBride, seven starts under his belt. He's allowed eight tanks. And so you can just imagine, you know, how frustrating this is for a guy like, you know, Butch Thompson that has kind of prided himself on being kind of a pitching guru, and he is. You know, we we don't compete for an AFL championship in 2013 without Butch. We don't. That's a guy that knows how to put a good game plan together, but it appears he's having trouble finding guys to execute uh, at the level that that he hoped. Let's look at some conference play numbers here, too. I think this is an important aspect of this thing, too, when you look at the pitching numbers. Now, the guys, there are only two pitchers. They got a 9.07 ERA in conference play. That's brutal. You only have two guys with an ERA under five in SEC play. And that's John Armstrong, who was a, a reliever for them, and then Carson Myers, the guy we talked about. You know, he, he's a guy that we'll, we'll see out of the bullpen at some point. But outside of that, the, the next 
Lowest ERA comes from Will Cannon. Another part-time starter, mostly a reliever, 8.44. Outside of that, everybody is 9-plus. Absolutely brutal. Zach Crotchfeld's the guy that started against us last year. ERA of 13-5. Only one appearance in SEC play this year. And they were expecting him to be a better guy this year. Uh, Joseph Gonzalez is a guy that they really thought he would come in and be the true Friday night guy for them and kind of elevate this team. He's made four appearances and three starts in SEC play. His ERA is 10.03. Allowed 23 hits in 11.2 SEC innings. Absolutely brutal numbers there. So we have to take full advantage. And you look, you talk about SEC play. Uh, SEC opponents are hitting 339 against Auburn pitching. And the deal, too, is, you know, all it takes is somebody to get hot and turn a series around for you. We've got to make sure we keep the pressure on them and not go up there and have negative at-bats. Now, what's interesting, too, I had a friend run some numbers for me uh, because it, sometimes it seems like our, our chase rate, and, of course, our chase rate, of course, is, uh, you know, swings at balls out of the strike zone. Who would you think leads Mississippi State? If you watch the dude effect, you already know this. The, uh, who do you think leads Mississippi State best chase rate? on the team. I'll give you a second. Shout out your answers. No, really, go ahead and say it. That's David Marchand. Do you know who's second? It's a surprising statistic to me. It's Logan Kohler. Now, some of that is because I think people feel like they can beat him with a fastball, so they're throwing more strikes, but he's not chasing. So he's getting pitches to hit. We need him to really have a good weekend for us. We really, really do. All right, looking real quickly at some SEC hitting numbers for them. I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? How do you perform against league pitching? Well, Auburn's hitting 261 as a team. But Cooper McMurray and Ike Irish kind of maintaining their same level of hitting in SEC play as they are in a non-conference competition. As a matter of fact, they might actually be a little bit elevated because Cooper McMurray hitting 364, Ike Irish 357. They've only hit 18 home runs. In SEC play. They've allowed 40. Yeah, let that marinate for a bit, right? And so I I don't know what the weather's going to look like. But uh, the reality of this is this is a team that it might all come together at some point. You just hope it's not this weekend. But these pitching numbers are absolutely abysmal. Now, real quickly, just kind of looking, you know, kind of where we are. Uh, real quickly, we'll run down the SEC standings as of right now. Of course, uh, A&M and Arkansas, excuse me, A&M and Alabama are in uh, in action right now with uh, A&M leading big. Uh, they'll play again this afternoon, doubleheader today. But uh, Kentucky, 14-1, and one, the best start in school history in Southeastern Conference play. And Kentucky basically fairly anemic when it comes to baseball tradition. If memory serves me correct, their first ever at national – SEC championship came with John Cohen. They may be in a position to get it here. It's nuts, man. It really is. And they have a two-game lead now because Arkansas is 12-3. and three. Arkansas drops the series last week in Alabama. So now Kentucky, a team that people picked in the bottom of the East, I think they were picked sixth in the East, leads the SEC by two games and five weekends to play. It's absolutely crazy, man. It is. Tennessee's 10 and 5, Vanderbilt 9 and 7, South Carolina 8 and 7, uh, Georgia 7 and 8, Florida 7 and 9, and Missouri 5 and 10. And uh, if, if the tournament started this weekend, if we went to Hoover, it'd be two teams from the West that are missing out. Uh, Arkansas leads the West with 12 and 3 record, AM 11 and 4, and about to be 12 and 4. And in states right there in third at 7 and 8, a game ahead of Alabama, two games ahead of Ole Miss. And then at the bottom is LSU 3 and 12, and Auburn 2 and 13. Let's be honest about this. Are you not rooting for LSU to miss Hoover? I mean, not just because that they're like a rival, but because don't you want this curse thing to continue as long as it's not us? It's nuts how it's worked out. Because as it stands today, LSU is two games out of last play, excuse me, two games out of last spot for Hoover and one game out of last place in the league. Yeah, let that sink in for a second. It's such a weird thing that's happened. But I find myself almost rooting for the curse. Because if it happened to us, misery loves company, right? 
it's pretty crazy how it's all worked out. Now, looking at some uh, you know, team leaders here, uh, Tennessee leads the league with a 334 average as a team. Mississippi State is hitting 282 as a team, uh, which is three spots, three points better than Auburn and a point better than OSU. Missouri, bottom of the league, 252. Pitching numbers, and of course last week it hurt us our standing a little bit here, but uh, Arkansas still leads the league with a 2.79 ERA. Right behind him is A&M. 3.21, Tennessee at 3.76, and there's a Kentucky, kind of surprising to be under four at 3.91. And then right there together is Vanderbilt and Mississippi State. Now, what's so interesting about that is everybody talks about how well Vanderbilt is pitching. And then some people say, well, you know, Mississippi State hadn't pitched as well as they should here as of late, and I agree with that. But then when you look at the totality of the season, and we're basically identical. I mean, just food for thought there. Bottom of the league is Florida, 6.57 ERA, and just above them is Auburn with a 6.12. Again, we have to take full advantage. Uh, Mississippi State was leading the SEC in fielding last week. We're now one one-hundredth of a point behind Florida, who's 981, State's at 980, tied with Arkansas and A&M. But defensively, we have cleaned things up. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, and look at individual numbers here. Again, Charlie Condon leading the league with a 482 average. We've, we have owned both. Triple crowns with Brent Rooker and Rafael Palmeira. We may have some company with Charlie Condon. And I don't mean this to be disrespectful to anybody, but I guarantee you if they have a triple crown winner at Georgia, they're going to find some way to display that in the stadium. We should too. I've said that we're the only ones in the, in, in the history of the league to have two triple crown winners, and uh, you would never know it by walking into uh, Duty Noble Field. Just, I mean, just, I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, Hagan Smith leads the SEC with a 1.53 ERA, 7-0 on the season, 89 punch outs, 17 walks. Uh, Ryan Prager, the AM Friday night guy, been outstanding. He's also 7-0. Luke Coleman at LSU. Imagine where we'd be right now if we had Luke Coleman. And imagine where LSU would be if they didn't have Luke Coleman. He's 6-2 on the year with a 2.15 ERA. They just don't have anything around him. But he's having a good year. Brady Tigert. A Mississippi uh, product, of course, grew up an Arkansas fan, and uh, he's at Arkansas, and uh, three and one on a year, but a two point five nine ERA. So you say, Steve, where are we? Well, out behind Will McIntyre, who was a reliever at, at Arkansas, uh, Cal Stephen, next on your list, two point eight four ERA with a five and two record. Uh, it's allowed thirty seven hits, uh, seventeen runs, sixteen of them earned, fifty six Ks against twelve walks. Absolutely nuts. Remember Mason Molina? We thought we had a good chance to get him. He ends up going to to Arkansas. Been outstanding for the Hogs. Again, they have a pitching staff capable of winning an AFL championship. It's just their offense. If you ever have a a below-average day offensively, if you're Arkansas, you're probably going to be in trouble. True story there. Now, the one thing that may keep Charlie Condon from winning the Triple Crown is Braden Montgomery's RBI numbers. He's got – Braden has 60. Condon has 52. And just behind Charlie Condon is Dakota Jordan with 51. I mean, does that kind of surprise you a little bit? I mean, based on some of the social media commentary, you wouldn't think, but there Dakota is right there in the middle of everything. But um, uh, but that's kind of where we stand. And so I, I just shared that because I think it's important, you know, to kind of know where we are and where everybody else is. And uh, just so you, for those of you that are unaware, Dave Marchand now fifth in the SEC in stolen bases. He is 17 for 17. And just ahead of him are two players with 18, one player with 19. So Dave Marchand has a good weekend this weekend on the base pass. He could be second in the league. And, of course, the guy that's running first is Cooper Wise. We already talked about him. Uh, So I think that's uh, interesting, uh, to say the least. Um, So we'll get to it. We'll get things rolling here. And uh, But that's kind of where we stand. And uh, I guess before we get into our our top ten list, let's uh, real quickly uh, talk about Kind of what happened last night. Uh, Vanderbilt, 10-5 winners over Florida. It was an interesting game. Of course, uh, Caglione's now hit eight home run, eight games in a row with a home run. So it's safe to say Cags has woken up. The, Gator, the rest of the Gators, not so much. Florida now 19-18. and 18. And, again, we lost that series, and we all kind of said this is going to hang with us for a while. They're 7-9 in the league, but 19-18 and 18 overall. Brutal situation. And again, Florida played for an AFL championship last year. Think about that for a second. LSU and Florida played for it all last year. 
LSU struggling to stay out of last place in the league, and Florida almost 500 now. Could enter the could, could conclude the weekend with a losing record overall. It's absolutely nuts. But again, 10 to five winner last night uh, is Vanderbilt at home. The difference in that ball game is that five run fifth. Uh, as we are, by the time that you hear this show, this game will have gone final. But they're in the ninth at Alabama A and M, 10 five. 10-5 in the ninth. So we'll go ahead and count that as a dub. Uh, looking ahead to what else we have here. Uh, again, A&M and Alabama are going to play game two of a doubleheader here in about an hour. Ole Miss is at Georgia. I like Georgia to take the series. Now, of course, uh, Ole Miss will hit some tanks, too. It's a launching pad down there at Foley Field. But uh, I just don't think they have enough firepower to kind of compete with Georgia, who is really good in their own ballpark, as everybody is, as this year has shown us again. Guys, Tennessee is at Kentucky. That's the marquee series of the weekend. Tennessee may get them, but I tell you this, Nick has been so good against Tennessee in the last couple of years, it's hard to pull against Kentucky in Lexington. There's something about Tony that uh, Nick's been able to kind of get after. Arkansas, of course, is in South Carolina. We really need Arkansas to take this. I mean, I, I'm, we're not going to catch Arkansas, so we need them to help kind of clear some traffic around us, help our seeding in the SEC tournament. Uh, of course, Florida's at Vanderbilt. That game's on ESPN2 tonight. And, again, you start thinking about what you, can you catch Vanderbilt. Well, you can, but I don't know if you're going to do it this weekend with Florida. Uh, LSU is at Missouri. LSU needs to get fat this weekend. But, man, wouldn't it be something if Missouri finds a way to win a game or two and get some more separation between them and LSU? Absolutely crazy, man. Uh, but that's where things stand. And uh, we look forward to a great weekend of baseball out at uh, Duty Noble Field. We hope you can come out there and join us. All right, time for today's top ten list. As always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. Blair Chandler, a mortgage professional. A lot of people out there in the industry kind of grinding, trying to do the best they can. But listen, when you're going to entrust something as important as your mortgage into the hands of somebody, you need to do it with somebody that's got the, the expertise and the experience to get you to the closing table. Make sure you don't get into a bad deal out there. Blair's been in the industry 23, 23 years. Last three years, he's been top 1% close ratio in the country. Thus, close with Blair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Blair's a guy that gets things done. Nobody stays in any industry 20-plus years by accident. Give Blair a call or text today at 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. Uh, Blair is a guy that uh, knows how to get you through the labyrinth of underwriting and to the closing table to make your dreams come true. Whether you're looking for a game day condo, maybe that's something you've always considered and you think, you know what, I don't know if we can afford it. Maybe you can it doesn't hurt to at least do some due diligence. And if you're looking to buy a home, you want to get your real estate agent motivated. You want to make sure that you find a home within your means. Get pre-qualified. No obligation. No commitment. Just get with Blair and say, hey, here's what we want to do. Here's what we're trying to do. Can you help us? And the answer more times than not is yes. Close at Blair.com. A proud sponsor of the Boneyard and the longtime sponsor of the Top 10 list. All right, tonight, or today, we complete our journey into sound by doing the top songs of 2010s. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that Dickie Betts died yesterday. So on, on Monday, we're going to honor his memory with the top 10 list. That's the plan. A lot of people hit me up, uh, including uh, my agent, and uh, who was uh, really, really sad. And I, I am too. I mean, you know what? I mean, the guy's 80 years old, but uh, one of the best guitarists of his era, without question. And, uh, of course, the Almond Brothers. Absolutely love those guys. It's incredible. You know, we have so many legends that are dying off, and such is life, right? I mean, you know, we all want to stay on this side of the grass as long as we can. But at some point, we're going in. But uh, all of these bands are uh, still alive and kicking. And so we're going to run through this, and uh, a pretty easy list to put together today. I, I made one change. I'm not going to tell you the bands that I didn't include until we get to the end, because I want there to be some eager anticipation. But uh, I appreciate all your feedback. A lot of people have said, Steve, I've so enjoyed this. And I uh, ha had a friend, a contributor at times to the top 10 list, hit me up and said, hey, Steve, I'm going to see uh, one of these bands, and 
Bad Omens and uh, learned about Bad Omens on your show. I absolutely love Bad Omens. I think you will, too. Had a chance to see them at the Signal in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when uh, the bride and I took our anniversary trip. It's nice to think about that. It was over 30 years ago. Next month will be 31 years. Crazy. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a rewarding endeavor. It really is. But uh, all that I understood, a lot of people say, Steve, where do you find these new bands? Well, most times I find them on uh, Sirius XM Octane. I'm an Octane listener. I'm not just an 80s hair nation guy. I like the new blood, too. And I think the 2010s were very, very good to us. As I mentioned, I thought the 2000s, especially late 90s, early 2000s, was a weird time in music. I mean, you know, it's like many of you, and you're going to get your feelings hurt, and that's okay. It's okay to get your feelings hurt. I mean, it's like we live in a society today where everybody expects to always just be, everybody's like, oh, you're, you're right. No, you're wrong. You, know, you notice we didn't do any Blink-182 or any Everclear, or Green Day, any of that stuff. You may like that stuff. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. That mean you can't. And when you do your show, you can do your top 10 list however you want to. But uh, I think the 2010s were a great time in music, a lot of new blood that has had a lot of staying power. We're going to start with 2010, a band that I absolutely love. I got into this band after M. Shadows kind of reinvented himself as a singer. It's true. It's true. City of Evil was uh, the album that really pulled me in. The song Bad Country is the one that was kind of my gateway track into Avenged Sevenfold. Saw them in Tupelo. Had a chance to meet him, Shadows, and uh, The Rev in passing. Uh, the, speaking of passing, The Rev did pass away. Kind of a crazy situation there. Jimmy, it's crazy. Uh, and Avenged Sevenfold was in the middle of uh, recording their follow-up to uh, the self-titled album which was amazing. Or maybe that's not right. I, I get confused. I'm old. But anyway, they were, they were recording the follow-up, and um, the Rav had like constructed and composed some incredible stuff, and uh, Avenged Sevenfold added Mike Portnoy from Dream Theater for this album cycle, and there was some discussion that he was going to continue on with Avenged Sevenfold. But uh, this album is absolutely amazing, and I think uh, Mike Portnoy may be the... Maybe the best drummer of this generation. And uh, we're going to go with the track Nightmare. And uh, it's got a little profanity in it. And, uh, and so we used to jam this. And, of course, Ian, who is uh, the best server at Bulldog Burger Company, my youngest, he loved the song. And uh, he didn't know what to say when um, the F-bomb came because it's your nightmare. So I convinced him we're going to say brothers. It's your brother's nightmare. So that's what even to this day we joke about that. It's your brother's nightmare. Great track. It'll make you grit your teeth and drive fast. All right, 2011. One of my favorite bands of this era, and of course, uh, they rose from the ashes of Creed after Scott Stapp was kind of unceremonious. We, you know, dismissed. And they went looking for a new singer, and they found one of my favorite singers of all time, Miles Kennedy, who was uh, with a band called the Mayfield Four. I think it's correct. Miles Kennedy, of course, has uh, really sung the soundtrack of my life now for, uh, you know, for about 25 years. Love his work with Slash. Love his solo stuff. But the things I love the most are his work with Alter Bridge. I remember where I was the first time I heard this song. I was, on, uh, I was in Gulf Shores, Alabama. We were down there, and uh, they were debuting the new single, and Isolation comes out. And, uh, of course, it's the first single off the AB3 album, which is phenomenal. Great follow-up to the album Blackbird. I think Mark Tremonti's shiny moment with Alter Bridge is on this track. I, I have many times likened this guitar solo to, like, if you taught a rattlesnake to play guitar, this is what it would sound like. Absolutely amazing track, and I think Miles Kennedy's vocal performance is next level. All right, 2012... I've had so many people since we first began talking about this band on this show that have become raving fans of the band Hellstorm. Uh, I won't take credit for that other than the fact that maybe I introduced you to them, but Lizzie Hale is, in my estimation, the best female rock singer since Janis Joplin. I, I think she is nuts, man. She is so incredibly talented. Uh, saw them on Scrooge in the co Coast, and uh, she walks out and sings the opening bars of I'm in love with somebody and it's not you, acapella. If you were there, you remember how magical moment that was. 
They had the uh, song of the year that year, according to Sirius XM Octane, and the, uh, the track is called Love Bites, and so do I. Love her attitude, man. I absolutely do. And uh, Lizzie now currently getting ready to front Skid Row on the final dates of their tour. So if you have a chance to go see Skid Row, you're going to see Lizzie Hale kind of singing those Sebastian Bach classics. And uh, Hellstorm actually covered Slave to the Grind. And you can find that, too, on Apple Music. And uh, you're going to be amazed at what a great job she does. So Hellstorm's Love Bites and So Do I, number 2012 on your list. At 2013, a band that we probably should have mentioned earlier in our journey into sound, it's Korn. Now, I absolutely love this album. Other people kind of looked at it and said, I'm not exactly sure what to expect here, Steve. I don't know if the paradigm shift kind of scratches me where I itch, because I'm a longtime Korn fan, and I, I'm often mistaken for somebody in Korn when I go to shows. The drunker people get, the more I look like I'm Jonathan Davis. But um, nevertheless, I love this album. I also like The Path of Totality. I love what Korn has done in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I, I truly have. Uh, I've loved nearly everything they've done. And there's a song that sounds excellent in the car, and it doesn't sound like anything else you've heard from Korn. It's a Narcissistic Cannibal from 2013 off the Paradigm Shift album. Absolutely amazing track. Now, 2014. This band just dropped a new single called House on Sand. I've met these guys, love these guys, and uh, as we discussed on the Dude Effect, uh, Ani and I met these guys when they were just on their ascent. They were still playing clubs, and they were everywhere on Sirius XM Octane. This song also, the rock song of the year, according to Octane listeners. This is the band that the rock scene needs. It's a layered sound. It's a very modern sound. It's not just straight ahead rock and roll. They've got a lot of, you know, a lot of synth- synthetic stuff in there. Some keyboard stuff. Some explosive sound. The engineering on this, uh, on the latest album, is just phenomenal. But uh, the gateway track for many of us to nothing more is a song called "This Is the Time." Now, it's one of these songs too because this is one of the things I love about Johnny is he writes about things that are relevant. He writes about things that are relatable, and this song is about. It's called Ballast. This is the time. Of course, a ballast is what uh, divers carry to control their level of buoyancy and things like that. And so basically, this song is about letting go of the things that hold you down. And it's one of those songs of empowerment and encouragement. I I need as much of that music as I can get in my life. There's enough things out there. If I want to listen to things that get me depressed, I can always dial up some old grunge stuff. Uh, But uh, the reality is that nothing more has something to say. Phenomenal band. I absolutely love them. Love the new stuff. I have every one of their albums. I've seen them multiple times, and I can tell you, if you are not a fan of nothing more, it means you probably haven't listened to them. It's, um, again, it's real rock, but it's not classic rock. It's very much modern, and it very much excites me every time I put it on. All right, moving ahead to 2015, another band. Uh, we're going to go across the, uh, the pond here for a bit. A band that uh, when I first began to hear them, I'm like, these guys are a little bit different. And uh, their sound has kind of become somewhat homogenized, too. You know, they were kind of a screaming band. They've added some electric influence into their performances. It's a band called Bring Me the Horizon. I absolutely love this band. And uh, this album is just one of those albums that I, I never get tired of. And I don't know how you guys feel. I don't know what you're looking for in life. I don't know, um, you know, what bands kind of get you excited. But the album, That's the Spirit, from Bring Me the Horizon, is one of those that I think that uh, there are no skips on the album. And then, of course, the the follow-up four years later was uh, Ammo, which is nuts, too. But uh, the song is Throne. And, uh, again, it's one of these songs, too, about kind of, you know, killing all that holds you, you know. Uh, There's just so many people out there, and uh, I've shared this with people too. You know, it's like uh, I've got so many of you guys that listen to the show and buy books and things like that, but I can promise you uh, there are more people trying to pull me down than there are propping me up. And I'm sure many of you feel the same way at times. You know, you think all these people love me. And uh, as my dad has told me years ago, and uh, if there's one thing that is prophetic that Freddie Robertson told me that uh, is a truism in life is that success will make you more enemies than anything else. People are more than happy for you to be mediocre with them. And uh, as I've shared with my children, 
you're going to find them when you enter the workforce. And for all of you college grads or future college grads, uh, listen up here. There are a lot of people out there that are content to be mediocre. They just want to stay off the bottom. They never truly want to ascend to the top. They just kind of want to keep, you know, keep the paychecks coming. I'm going to do just enough to keep the paychecks coming. And occasionally I'll have a good year, a good month, or a good quarter and get a good bonus. And I can take a nice trip or whatever and, and post the Instagram out there like I've got it better than y'all. But the reality of it is, is that most people are just content to just kind of be average. It's true. It's true. And I, it used to offend me. I used to say, I don't understand why people don't want more. Now that I'm older, I'm kind of like, I'm just kind of glad that they don't because there's just less people in the way. It is easier not to be great. It certainly is. It is easier not to be great. And um, I think I've shared this with you. If I hadn't, I'll give you a real, real brief comment about this. One of the things that I heard years ago, I've never forgotten this, is really the secret to success is to never arrive. Never, ever, ever arrive. Never, ever get to a point where you think, okay, I've made it. And I remember after I wrote Flim Flam, and I won't tell you the guy's name because I don't want to break anonymity, but it's somebody you know. It's a name you know. I got really depressed for Flim Flam. Truly depressed. Not, not just, hey, I'm kind of blue. I thought, I'll never have a story quite like this again. And we sold, oh my gosh, so many books. And I said, I've already peaked as an author. And my dear friend, as I shared that with them, said it's not about peaking. It's like now that you're here, stay here. Stay relevant. And uh, I'm always trying to find the next level, and I think the dude, the new book, is going to uh, probably sell as well as Flim Flam did. I, I truly believe that. The early returns and your interest in this book is uh, really unlike anything that I've seen. Dogpile, of course, had a lot of that too. Uh, but, I, but I share that with you not to praise me or anybody around me, but to maybe encourage you. You know, if you feel like, hey, this is, you know, the, my best years are behind me, I simply don't believe that for me. I, I don't believe it for you either. I believe the best is to come for all of us as long as we're willing to work for it. I have worked with and for so many people in my lifetime that once they reached a comfortable standard of living, they quit pushing. You know, my, my feeling is like the only thing better than $10,000 is $20,000. You and know, the only thing better than, you know, six books on the bestseller list is seven. You know, and so I think it's important, no matter what you do in life, is to always be looking for the next step up. Always be trying to find a way to ascend. But bring me the horizon of the throne. That's from 2015. Now, a band that I was a little late to the bandwagon on back in 2016, uh, Dana, the bride, she loved them from the very beginning. I did not. I think they were kind of sophomoric in many respects. But in time, I said, you know what? These guys have kind of built a following. Maybe I should give them another chance. Not that they needed me to download their albums or you know, go to their show. They didn't need that. They had enough people doing it. But it's Five Finger Death Punch. I used to call them Five Finger Fruit Punch uh, just because of the fact I didn't think they had much substance to what they wrote. And in some respects, they don't. But I think that Ivan Moody, in many respects, has really matured as a songwriter. He's in recovery now. Uh, so I certainly want to support other people in artistry that are in recovery. Uh, it's a difficult undertaking. But a uh, great track from them back from 2016 called Wash It All Away. Now, my favorite Five Finger song features Rob Halford from Judas Priest. It's Lift Me Up. Absolutely love that one. Oh, my gosh. It's absolutely incredible. And that was one of those songs, too. It's like, you know, now that I've listened to this, maybe I was wrong about these guys. And I think that's part of maturity, too, is kind of getting to a point that say, you know what? My initial reaction, the early gong, may have been the incorrect response. Uh, and I love the song Champagne, too. I absolutely love it. I can relate to that so much, you know. It's all sham pain, not the drink. You know, it's like there's all these things that are going on, and it's, it's, it's just kind of all fake. Yeah, you know, there's so much of that in life that's fake. That's why when you encounter something that's real in your life, sometimes you don't know how to handle it. Whether it be love, whether it be responsibility, you know, there's so many things, and uh, again, I feel like I'm preaching, but there's so many things in relationships in life that are built on sand, and it may be romantic relationships or business relationships or even friendships. There's so much of that. And it's like, well, you know, they just, people just kind of show up and you just kind of allow them to stay there because you're thinking, you know what, I'm better with this than to not be alone. And maybe there's some truth in that. But when your relationships are based on something fake, what do you do when something real comes along? Do you even recognize it? I mean, truthfully, I'm speaking to both of us, right? 
When something real comes along, do you hitch your wagon to it? Or are you so scared to get out of your comfort zone that you just say, you know what, I'm just going to stay right here you know, with this unfulfilling relationship or this unfulfilling friendship or this unfulfilling job? And, uh, you know, the, the old expression is that, you know, fear killed more dreams than failure ever could. That relates to our personal lives, too. It's true. Run the fakery out of your life. Latch on to something's real. At least you know you can trust that. All right, 2017, this band kind of came out of nowhere. And I remember sharing this with a friend of mine, and I goes, man, that sounds like a Robert Plant whale there. And they do, in many respects, sound a little bit like a Led Zeppelin cover band. But when this song hit the airwaves, a lot of these old heads like me are like, dude, these guys are great. And Jake Mangum hit me up one day and says, hey, I'm thinking about changing my, my, my uh, walkout song. Of course, he was in minor leagues then and uh, was considering going this direction. He loves this band. Jake Mangum approved. It's Greta Van Fleet, and we're going with their gateway track for us. It's Highway Tune. It sounds like something off Houses of the Holy from Led Zeppelin. It's absolutely eerie how much the singer sounds like Robert Plant. Uh, their catalog is much deeper than that. I know you, many of you are raving fans of Greta Van Fleet, and I encourage you to check them out if you haven't. All right, 2018. A band, in many respects, kind of brought back some of the mystery and some of the black magic effects of music. And for many years, people didn't know who was in this band and who was it. And there were people that kind of came and went uh, from other bands as they were in between projects, just to kind of continue to create. And I remember on that metal show when they asked Sebastian Bach, of the new blood, who do you really like? And without hesitation, he said, I love the band Ghost. And that's who we're talking about here. Now, my favorite Ghost song is Square Hammer. I, I absolutely dig it. My second favorite track is uh, our 2018 selection today. It's Rats. Rats. Dig it. Saw these guys play it side stage at Rocklahoma. Thanks, Mark. And uh, we had such a great time there. And uh, what's so funny about that is because they wear masks on stage and they're all cloaked up and nobody knows who they are. And uh, we had artist passes for the weekend. And I had many recording artists walk up to me and ask me if I was in Ghost. Funny. I should have just said yes, right? But no, I, I didn't. We, we were guests of another band. And um, nevertheless, it was truly surreal and remarkable to get a chance to see Ghost perform live. If you get a chance to do that, let me encourage you to get out and go do that. They, they put on an amazing show. They really do. All right, 2019. It's amazing that we haven't discussed this band. I mean, we, we've talked about, you know, 60 years in music, and we haven't touched on this band. And they are one of my favorite bands of all time. Yes, it's the Pet Shop No, it's not the Pet Shop Boys. I always use them as a joke, and you guys get it, and you laugh and chuckle every time. No, it's, culture, no, it's not Culture Club either, silly. It's Tool. The return of Tool. Of course, they weren't on Apple Music, and I remember Derek Cody tweeting at me just before they released their full catalog on Apple Music and said, well, what's going to be the first Tool songs that you download? Well, for me, it was Vicarious. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite Tool song. However, when Tool returned... An incredible track, absolutely nuts. And I was like, where has this been? You know, of course, uh, Maynard done a lot with, um, you know, a lot with a Perfect Circle and, and, and uh, Pussifer, but uh, it's a different deal when they get back, with, when Tool gets back together. It's a much different dynamic. But the title track, Fear Inoculum, is next level, man. That's your 2019 selection. Fear Inoculum from Tool. It is so absolutely incredible. And uh, so if you don't know Tool, you should. Those guys do all kind of crazy stuff. Like they'll uh, they'll put Danny the drummer in the studio and they'll pump in helium. And he'll wear like an oxygen mask and play because of the fact that, you know, the helium changes the, the pressure on the drums. And it creates a sound that they can't replicate with a computer. And so I love people that are still experimenting with music. And, and the fact that an established band like Tool, a legendary band like Tool, that uh, came to us with that great debut album of Undertow with the track Sober and then went out on Lollapalooza was uh, incredible. And so grateful to have uh, some new music for a new generation. I hope you've enjoyed our series. And uh, I certainly have enjoyed putting all this together. Though at times it has been very stressful. Now some bands that we didn't include on our list today that I do want to give a shout out to is Pop Evil. I nearly had Pop Evil in there for 2014. Uh, the song uh, Torn to Pieces. Absolutely, absolutely love Pop Evil. Uh, Dane and I have met Lee Kakati, who is the, uh, met the whole band, but Lee 
so incredibly amazing. And every time that I have seen Lee, he's one of these kinds of guys that's just like, you know, he doesn't put on airs. He's just one of those guys, very down-to-earth guy. And uh, turn to pieces about, is about when his dad died and how difficult it was to make it through that. And, uh, of course, I love 155. I started to get that on my license plate, but one of you guys already has it. But uh, I absolutely dig that band. Ten years, another one of my favorites. They didn't make our list. Uh, we haven't done a ten years top ten. We will do one soon. Absolutely amazing band. Blackstone Cherry, of course. Love those guys, too. Uh, Chris Robertson, a distant cousin that I'm sure we can't claim, but uh, we'll call it. Uh, love those guys, too. Love everything they've done. And then Three Days Grace. They didn't make our list in 2000 or in 2010. Uh, I would, if I would throw out a bonus track for you today, it's uh, The High Road from Three Days Grace. Absolutely love that track. And, uh, again, the only band that's had more number one songs in the history of rock and roll is Shinedown. Three Days Grace is second. I remember when Shinedown broke Van Halen's record, and then Three Days Grace was right behind them, and you're like, well, wait, when Adam Gautier left the band, I thought that was it for Three Days Grace, but it hasn't been. They've been great. A lot of staying power with these bands. And so I appreciate all of your contributions. And, uh, again, we've had some people send some, some submissions in, if I can get it out, uh, and we'll try to get some of those next week. But, uh, again, planning on Dickie Betts for Monday if things uh, – go as planned. If you have ideas, let us know. Reach out to Roy on Twitter at Dogmatic67. Probably a good follow. He's not going to spam your feed with like food pics or feet pics or anything like that. Uh, that doesn't paint his nails and like tweet out pictures of that. He's not that kind of guy. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just not who Roy Samanti is. And you can find our great list on Spotify also under the handle Dogmatic67, D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. You can find me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart, a Starkvillian institution. Guys, if, you, if you're not buying your Mississippi State merchandise from Campus Bookmart, you're probably not getting the best selection. You're also not supporting a Starkville business, which we always encourage, even if you live out in a mission field beyond the great state of the uh, state lines of Mississippi. You can still support a Starkville business, the place you love, the place you really want to be whenever you get a chance. The best selection of Mississippi State merchandise exists at Campus Bookmark. Next time you're in town, go by and see their smiling faces. Neatly positioned on the backside of campus, just make that turn at the Trooper Station. Off of 182, we encourage you to obey all posted speed limit signs there and everywhere else. Uh, but if you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmark.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. Tons of Mississippi State baseball merch. And you're going to want to outfit the kids for that trip to Disney this summer. Be sure and rep the brand wherever you go. Let people know you're a proud Mississippi State fan. Nothing cooler than being out on vacation. Next thing you know, you're in another Bulldog. Next thing you know, you got built-in friends. Cool. And uh, I would say, too, you know, Mom, everybody in the family would love, love, love a surprise gift that includes Mississippi State. You know it's true. You know it's true. Buy yourself a sundress, too, while you're at it. It's that time of year. Campus bookmark. All right, so everybody wants to know, what do we expect to see out of the spring game? <clears throat> now, the first thing that I'm going to caution you about, you don't learn anything from spring games. You don't. Of course, you like to see some people stand up and do good things, but we've had some years in the past where we've had some spring game heroes that don't see the field much during the year. That's not something that's just germane to Mississippi State. But the first thing that I want to see from the spring game is everybody get out of it healthy. The last thing that you ever want to see happen in a spring game is somebody go down with an injury that prevents them from going through summer workouts and being at their best when we take the field when it matters most. That's the first thing that I want. Get out of there injury-free, period. Everything else is a bonus. Now, the number two thing that I want to see is I want to see some execution. You know, I want to see them go out there and look like they know what they're doing. I, I believe in Jeff Labby. I think we're going to get out here and, and have a lot of fun. You know, we've got a very challenging schedule this year. If we can be a bowl team this year, that's a step in the right direction, certainly, after what we all endured last year. 
But I want to see Blake Shapin and the Bulldog quarterbacks throw the ball with some level of proficiency. I want the wide receivers to go out there and run routes like everybody's on the same page. I don't want to see a bunch of misfires and things like that, right? Now, they're not going to be in midseason form by any stretch of the imagination, but I want us to look like we are an organized, well-coached operation. The number three thing that I want to see is I want to see some shots down the field. Now, like all of you, when we heard about the air raid, everybody kind of remembers those great years with uh, Graham Harrell and Michael Crabtree at Texas Tech, and you're challenging people vertically. We get into the SEC, and Barry Odom says, you know what, I'll just work to drop eight here and force their quarterbacks to, to do it underneath and put together these long 10, 12-play drives, hope they mess it up. And at times, we did. I want to see us be able to dial up some shots and really challenge down the field outside the numbers. I want to see some big plays. Now, of course, you say, but Steve, it makes the defense look bad. I want the defense to make some plays too, but I want to see us be aggressive. Now, knowing what you know about Jeff Levy, his time at Ole Miss in Oklahoma, he is a very aggressive play caller. In addition to that, I want to see some tempo. I want to see us go up there to the line. When we get a big game, let's immediately go up there and get another play and get into a manageable second down situation. I want to be able to put pressure on the defense. That's going to require your offensive lineman, of course, to be in great physical condition. But I want to see us dial up some things that get the crowd on their feet, and I want us to be able to execute. Not just see the play calling itself, but the execution of those principles really play out in live time. I also want to see a nice crowd. And a lot of people are already thinking, well, you know, Steve, it's going to rain. Listen, how often do you get a chance to do this? I mean, really, it's Super Bulldog weekend. We're expecting some raucous crowds at Duty Noble Field. We need that same level of intensity at the spring game. you got a ton of recruits in town. And so it's a chance for us to sell Mississippi State, not only as a university and athletic department, a football program, but as a fan base. How many times do you hear about, hey, I want to go somewhere where football matters. I want to go somewhere that's a great fan base, that people care and get excited, and they're going to turn out and they're going to support the team. So if you're on the fence about coming, let me encourage you to come and be a part of this just because of the fact that you get to be a part of selling Mississippi State. You get to be a part of maybe being the difference when a young man goes home and considers his college football future, so you know what? I went to Starkville and had a great day. I had a ton of people show up just for a spring game. Football matters at Mississippi State. I think that's an important dynamic of this. And everybody wonders, well, how can I play a part? You know, Steve, I'm, I can't afford to be a season ticket holder. You know, I can't afford to give a lot of money to Bulldog Initiative. And you know what? I get that. There have been times in my life I was in that same situation. It didn't mean that I loved Mississippi State any less. I just was not in a situation financially at that point in my life to be able to contribute. But what you can do is contribute a cowbell. You can contribute a maroon shirt in the stadium. You can contribute your voice and be out there to support your team. It's not just our team. It's your team. And so I encourage you to take some personal investment here and some personal accountability and say, you know what, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there to cheer for this team. I want to see Jeff Levy's group. And you say, well, it's a spring game. Guys, any time that we get a chance to get together as a fan base and celebrate Mississippi State, that's a wonderful opportunity. I got some friends out. The only time I ever see them is during football and baseball season. That's the only time. And so I shared that with you because of the fact I think that all of us have an opportunity to really kind of make a difference with this. And it's not just about you know, recruiting. And when you think about this team, what do you want your team to know about you? Not just about everybody else, but about you. We want to be able to get out there and demonstrate to this coaching staff that we believe in them, to these players that say, you know what, hey, we're going to be here. You know, we're going to be here for a spring game. We're going to be here for um, you know, the big games too. Obviously, we're not going to have the same level of attendance, but it's free to get in. And if you're coming to the baseball game, I mean, just encourage you to get here early and come be a part of it. Go watch a spring game. You can make that walk over to uh, Duty Noble Field and then go cheer for the the Diamond Dogs. And, of course, you know, hey, this series with Auburn is going to count in the win-loss total, right? That doesn't mean that the spring game is insignificant because it absolutely is not. 
it's important for us to get out here and support this team. I think Jeff Levy is going to do some incredible things at Mississippi State. And, again, I think this year is going to be a challenging one. I do. And I think we're going to have to probably be proficient on offense, perhaps better than we have been the last couple of years. And I think a new scheme kind of enables us to do that. Uh, I remember, you know, when Mike Leach went down to LSU in 2020 and nobody knew what to expect, and we go down there and whip the Tigers, and the game probably should have been worse than it ended up being. We, K.J. Costello threw a couple of picks that were uh, inexplicable. They were. But schematically, we looked like we knew what we were doing. And we went down there and beat the defending national champions in our own backyard. And I remember how embarrassing it was for LSU. Of course, that was back when we had the COVID restrictions and they weren't allowing full crowds. And you look around that stadium, this state is marching up and down the field and just absolutely shredding them with crossing routes. And the fans were shocked. And all of a sudden, you start hearing this racket and they're piping in crowd noise at LSU. Makes you wonder if they don't do it all the time. That's a very difficult place to play, even under any circumstance. But all of a sudden, you hear this racket come through the speakers, and you look around, and you realize that every bit of this is fake. And so my hope is Jeff Lubby can have that same impact in an SEC game this year, that we go on the road and we get people kind of sitting on their hands with their mouth aghast, wondering, like, what in the world is happening? And the first step in that is tomorrow. It's the first chance that all of you have had a chance to see the Bulldog football team together. And, of course, we've had very limited availability. And, um, you know, we've had some of our staff out there to kind of watch things when things have been open. But um, you know, no 11-on-11 stuff, right? And uh, that, that's not about Jeff being coy and things like that. These guys are working, and I respect that. They have to do what they feel is best to prepare this football team and to kind of mesh this staff together, right? Offensively, you've got a bunch of guys that know each other and know the terminology. They know what to expect. There's an expectation. They all have bought into L- Lovey's way of doing things. Defensively, it's a different deal. You've kind of got a hodgepodge group there that's kind of learning to work together for the first time. And so I get it. Everybody's got to be on the same page, and that includes the fans. We all have to be on the same page. Now, I know what's going to happen. We're going to have some people that come to the spring game, and they're going to immediately go get on Facebook with their hot takes. Ah, oh, it's going to be long year, guys. You know, you don't know that. You're not going to be able to tell anything from the spring game. You're going to learn more about our fans than you are about our team as we get. That's how I see it. So it's a chance for us, again, not that we care about outside opinions and influences and things like that. But I think about how many times in the past when I have interviewed a a recruit, a young man that uh, was considering Mississippi State, and he goes, you know what, I went to that spring game. I was really impressed with the crowd. The fans are really into the game, and it's just a spring game. I want to remind you, too, uh, of a great story, a Super Bulldog weekend story of legendary proportions. So a young man by the name of Rafael Palmero was invited to Mississippi State to take his official visit. Now, at that time, Rafael Palmero was leaning towards Miami. Of course, he lived in Miami, He'd grown up uh, in Havana, Cuba. Then you know, his family made the move to America. And the Hurricanes, of course, were a national power at the time. They had won the NFL championship the year before, and Ron Frazier's telling Palmero he's probably going to redshirt. And Palmero's like, I don't want a redshirt, so I'm going to continue looking. But he was still leaning towards Miami. And he comes to Mississippi State. And his official visit took place during Super Bulldog weekend. Ole Miss was our guest for baseball. And Bruce Castoria, the legend, hit a home run to basically give us the separation needed to beat Ole Miss. And the crowd went nuts. And Rafael Palmero, who I have interviewed now for two books, Dog Pile and Alpha Dogs, and if you haven't read those, you should, And Rafi talks a little bit about this. And he said when that ball left the field and Bruce is rounding the bases, the crowd went absolutely nuts. And he goes, you know, baseball really matters here. These fans really support this team. And even these days, Miami doesn't draw big crowds. There's a lot of of, uh, competition for your entertainment dollar in Miami, Florida. At a place like Mississippi State, baseball matters. Sports matter. They are the ties that bind us together. It is the great maroon thread that sews us together as a family. 
And Rafael Palmero was so incredibly impressed with you and your support of the Diamond Dogs and your support of Mississippi State. He goes, you know what? I want to come here. And then our friend Trent and Torsha came with him. If memory serves me correct, Trent was from Southwind High School. I think that's right. And so Trent's with Rafi that weekend. They said, you know what? We're going to go here. And they do. Where would our program be today without Rafi or Palmero? Would the Palmero Center even exist? I'm sure we'd have some uh, indoor practice facility, but it would be as nice as it is. And it all started in many respects at Super Bulldog Weekend. And that's why I say it, fan attendance and support matters because you make Mississippi State sports matter. And you demonstrate that to young people that may be guests of the university for the first time. That's an important thing to consider. And maybe when you think about staying home this weekend, kind of consider that maybe the next Dak Prescott or Rafael Palmero may be in town. And maybe they're on the fence about Mississippi State, and they come here and say, you know what? I like this place. I like this fan base. I like this school. I like the surroundings because of the fact that sports matter at Mississippi State. It's the biggest show in town. And so please turn out and come support the Diamond Dogs and, and certainly Super Bulldog Weekend. It's going to be a, a great weekend. We're going to have a lot of people here. A ton of people are going to be in town. And again, it is an opportunity for us to both celebrate and sell Mississippi State. And all of us have a role in that. Every single one of us. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Uh, here's the deal. If you're looking to bring a, a big group to town, look no further than the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. It is just five minutes away from Mississippi State's historic sporting venues. Conveniently located but also kind of tucked away where it's a little bit quiet. You can have some peace and quiet. You only got a couple neighbors out there. You know, so we don't want you to throw in a rave, but you can get out there and enjoy some peace and quiet and just the commonality and community of being home, kind of a home away from home. And you can have everybody under one roof. Maybe you, maybe you live in Starville and you don't have an opportunity. Maybe your home's not big enough to entertain. And so, you know what? I want all my college friends to be here. We're going to have a reunion of sorts. Maybe it's a uh, bridal shower weekend. Maybe it's a guys get together weekend. Maybe you can get all your guys together. Maybe it's a father son weekend. You're going to come up here and just kind of be dudes and just kind of hang around and sit on that back porch and maybe put some steaks on the grill. Maybe have an adult beverage or two. You can fully stock that kitchen. And rather than having to go, you know, chase reservations everywhere, you can just cook right there at the place. Also got that wet bar too. So if you enjoy adult beverage, you uh, have access to that. That big fire pit area in the back. It's going to be some cooler temperatures here. Uh, for a stretch, which is always nice. But uh, listen, you couldn't find a better place to stay. Whether you're bringing a work group to town for a midweek function, or maybe perhaps you're coming in for a great weekend of sports at Mississippi State, Google the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Their Facebook page will come up, and you can you know, review the pictures that are available there and kind of see all the amenities that are available to you. In addition to that, too, some booking options are going to come up, VRBO, Airbnb. Hey, if you want to go that route, you can. But if you want to save some money, I can help you with that. Book through the Evolve website. It's the same facility no matter who you book it with, but you can pay a little less, and you could pay more, but why? Book through Evolve. I'll give you promo code BSR10. That saves you 10% off your stay at the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Renovated clubhouse of the old country club. And, again, plenty of space and, uh, you know, wide openness out there where you can just kind of enjoy a relaxing weekend while you're supporting the Bulldogs or working around the Golden Triangle. Nothing could be better than staying in the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. And how cool would it be mom, dad, grandma and grandpa now? You know, maybe you've reached that point in your life. How cool would it be to have all the kids and the grandkids under one roof and let mom cook, get in there with all the uh, – all the daughters and sisters or whatever, and everybody kind of there and just prepare a meal. Maybe it's like a Thanksgiving event, you know. I, I don't know what your needs are, but I can tell you this. You can be accommodated at the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Be sure and check it out today. All right, and next week, uh, we're going to kind of give you a bit of an update on uh, where things stand with men's basketball. Uh, Coach Chris Jans and the staff out uh, you know, on the road, you know, out there working, trying to get your roster kind of rebuilt. we got some room to work with, uh, as you guys are well aware. And uh, I want to talk about a couple things here. You know, I, I see, you know, we, we've had some, uh, you know, had some traffic, I guess, in many respects, you know, with the portal 
And, uh, and we, I remind you guys this all the time. It doesn't just happen to us. You're only acutely aware of it because you live in the maroon bubble. But I like the fact that we've already gone out and gotten some size, right? I mean, how many times this year do we, do we deal with all that? You know, of course, uh, you know, Tolu is moving on. We absolutely wish him the best. You know, Jimmy Bell's out there now trying to play a little football for us. Could be an offensive tackle, as Jeff Levy says. Uh, but that's a cool thing, too. But the thing that I have said many times on this show and others is the thing about Chris Jans that has been the most intriguing thing to me is not this the coaching of the defensive prowess and the level of effort intensity. But this is a guy that comes from a junior college background. This is a guy that uh, did some really good things out there in New Mexico. And he is a guy that understands how the portal works. Now, we listen, we extend a ton of offers to prep players. We really do. We are, we are very, very, very prolific when it comes to extending offers to prep players. And a lot of times it's just trying to get in the boat thing. It's like, hey, we'll throw this out here and see if there's some return interest, and then we'll kind of go from there. But Chris Jans, because of his junior college background, understands how to rebuild a roster in a short amount of time. Got a good nucleus, obviously. And I think Cam Matthews playing the best basketball of his career down the stretch last year. Cam will be our leader next year. And, of course, Josh Hubbard. A lot of people were worried that maybe Josh would pursue some other opportunities. And a lot of people on Twitter, every time he would tweet out, you'd have Kentucky fans or Tennessee fans or Ole Miss fans who are ever basically begging him to get in the portal. But it appears that State is going to be able to navigate through that situation without any problems. Uh, yeah, and that's – Again, good forward thinking by Chris Jans and everybody involved with the Bulldog Initiative. Just kind of, let's just kind of take care of our situation here. We know that Josh Hubbard is a rising superstar in the Southeastern Conference, so let's make sure that we keep him here in Starkville. They've been absolutely devastating. And, of course, we've lost a lot. Let's, let's not discount that. Uh, but I think Chris Jans is a guy, because of the way that he coaches and the fact that he has so much experience getting guys that fit his system and then kind of getting them to buy into what he's doing. And so I got a tremendous amount of confidence in the direction of things, no matter what happens in this portal thing. And, and of course, things get crazy, man, with the portal. I mean, men's basketball has always been, in many respects, kind of sleazy. Let's just kind of call it for what it is. And so you need a coach that can navigate through some of that nonsense and still be able to get good players. And how many times in the past, and, uh, you know, we've had, you know, we've had some situations where we felt really good and then ultimately had people kind of buy players out from under us. And you said, but, Steve, you know, that should never happen. Well, Sometimes the asking price suggests that you're not going to get the juice for your squeeze. And so that's where I think you have to be judicious in how you handle your NIL dollars. And uh, there are a lot of people out there to say, you know what, Steve, I'm just really disappointed in how the season ended. I, I am too. And I can assure you Chris Jans is as well. You know, we've been to in two back-to-back NCAA tournaments. And so if you don't think that we have done better, I mean, Ben Howland went to one his entire tenure. Chris Jans has been here twice for two years, and we've been to the tournament each of those two years. And, yeah, we probably should have been a little bit better than we were down the stretch. We knew it was going to be just an absolutely terrible schedule. We knew it was going to be a real challenge. And then I think in many respects we just kind of ran out of gas. It's a disappointing result losing to Michigan State. It was. It absolutely was. And, and listen, Tom Izzo is one of the greatest men's basketball coaches of all time. So, I mean, you got to bring your hard hat. You'll play in the Spartans, especially in the tournament. But for those of you that have kind of said, well, I just don't know, I, I'm going to encourage you to kind of rethink that. I think when we get this roster reconstructed, I think you're going to feel really good about the direction of things. And, you know, it's going to be a while before we you know, see the basketball team together. And you got plenty of time to kind of work and meld these guys together. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm excited. I, I am. And uh, I know many of you are, are kind of watching the portal traffic with care. And you're thinking, you know what, Steve, you know, we have work to do, and we absolutely do. But I trust that Chris Jans is the man that can uh, can get that taken care of for you. Absolutely. Give you a little bit of an update on the book, too. Uh, I'm about uh, 15 chapters in now, and it's probably going to be closer to 25 chapters rather than 20. The original plan was 20. But as the story has unfolded, there's just been some moments in Mississippi State uh, history during the Duty Noble era that I haven't been able to just adequately tell in one chapter. And so rather than rush that, and kind of leave out some important details. I said, you know what? I'm going to take as long as it takes and write as much as we need to to tell the story. Now, I'll still be done roughing this thing out by the end of May. Don't, don't fret. Like I said, it, it, we're, we're probably we're 15 chapters in right now. We were planning to go to 20, probably end up somewhere around 23, 24, maybe 25. But uh, I can be a very prolific writer. And uh, I, yesterday, I just kind of took a day off. 
uh, from the website, which I rarely do, but every so often I just kind of need a break. And uh, I, I'm a workaholic, I admit that, but uh, I just needed a break yesterday. I had having to deal with some things and, you know, uh, and so I just kind of took a break and just kind of let that breathe a little bit and kind of focused on the book. And uh, I'll tell you, there is, uh, there's, a, there's a, a segment in this book that details out a very important era in Mississippi State sports history. And it's not just about football. Uh, but I want to talk about Duke Humphrey for a little bit. You guys know him from, uh, you know, obviously Humphrey Coliseum. But Duke Humphrey you know, took over from President Hugh Critz. And uh, Hugh, of course, kind of rose to power after the great Bilbo Purge of 1930. And Kritz stayed with us for four years. And uh, then Duke Humphrey gets the job. Now, when Kritz was our president, they were, in many respects, and Duty Noble was the athletic director for, for much of that time, our administration's hands were tied by the athletic control board that was funded by the state government. And they had a say in who could be fired. And if you don't know much about the Bilbo Purge, you'll learn a lot in the book. And I would encourage you to do your own research. But basically, uh, Governor Bilbo basically decided that um, because of the fact that state and Ole Miss and other schools were funded by state dollars, that he should have a say in how they were ran. And ultimately fired all three state uh, school presidents at Ole Miss, State, and the W, and then rehired other people within about two hours. And there were over 300 faculty members they were given their walking papers. And I read some accounts, too, where a couple people were fired because they, they drank whiskey. Yeah, that's how crazy the whole thing got. We had a madman as governor back then. And so that term ends, and um, there's a change in leadership. And then Duke Humphrey, of course, kind of comes along. So all of a sudden, Duke is a guy that has the opportunity to have some say in things, you know, and uh, was really – more of the driving force behind the hiring process when we went out and hired Major Raf Sassy. And if you don't know much about that era in, in Mississippi State Athletics, it, it is one of the most important stretches in Mississippi State Athletics history. Because of the fact, we went out and hired one of the best coaches in the country. And he immediately came in here and won. And he enabled our fans to believe that anything is possible at Mississippi State. That 1935 season, absolutely bananas, man. We beat Alabama for the first time in 20 years. We went and played at West Point and beat Army in their own backyard. It was crazy. And this is a program that had, lost, had seven losing seasons in a row. You got a new sheriff in town. And there's some crazy things that happened, you know, over the next couple of years. We, we won a lot of football games, and some weird stuff happened. But I think Duke Humphrey is, again, a name that you don't maybe know as well, but I think – the lesson that I learned from doing this research about Duke Humphrey is that his name is rightly positioned on an athletic venue at Mississippi State because I believe Duke Humphrey kind of enabled us to dream about bigger things. Is that, hey, you can go out and get a high-quality coach to come play and coach at Mississippi State, and they can win at Mississippi State. And there were some previous coaches. I mean, Bernie Beerman's a guy that uh, I've read some stuff that he did. And he goes, you know, I had a good time at Mississippi State. But, you know, they weren't really committed down there. And the players were all small. And the schedule was too tough. And uh, it was basically a lot of excuse making. Of course, Beerman, uh, Beerman did some great things at Minnesota. I'm not in any way kind of discounting his career. But I think when I look at Mississippi State, and I think about when we pool our resources and our talent together, we can do some great things, especially when we have great leadership. And we do now. But I think it's important to want more at Mississippi State. I think it's important for us to say, you know what? It, things don't have to always be the way they've been. And you can't buy into this whole thing that we're not good enough, that we're not capable of great things. I am not a person that believes we have to lower the hurdles in order for State to be successful. I don't believe that. And I don't think Zach Selman believes that, and I know Dr. Mark Keenum doesn't believe that. I can promise you. But I think our fans need to adopt that, that same mentality. Many of you already have that. You know, this is not your grandfather's Mississippi State. You know, things have changed. Uh, I had a chance to have lunch earlier this week. A lot of times I go in the afternoon just so I can kind of be alone. And I uh, went down to eat, and a couple of young men that were sitting there, I say, again, I say young men, they weren't young. And we talked about that aspect of things. This old timer turned to me and he goes, you know, he goes, you know, I've, I've traveled around this conference a lot and Mississippi State is not behind other schools facility wise like we once were. 
Guys, I remember a time when Rocky Felker cut up football film in a single wide trailer that was gifted to us from a high school over in Alabama. You're going up against some of the best coaches in the country, and your head coach is cutting up film in a donated trailer. And that's in the 1980s. I mean, let that sink in for a second. And it shows you how far we've come. We've got the SEAL Junior Complex now that's uh, absolutely amazing. Absolutely is. One of the things that we promised Dan Mullen we hired him, we'd go build a football-only complex and get everybody out of the Bryan Building. Of course, we needed the office space in the Bryan Building. A lot more comfortable out there now. And uh, Bryan Building actually undergoing a bit of a facelift right now internally. Some things are being changed with office spaces and things like that. One of the, one of the projects is Zach Selman. But, again, we talk about selling Mississippi State. We talk about making these financial commitments. And listen, I, I think the days of the facility wars are probably over for a while until they get a handle on this NIL stuff. But I'm incredibly proud of the steps that we've taken. Incredibly proud. And when I go back and I research our history for these books, and uh, I get very maniacal about it, to be honest with you, it is an obsession for me. And I have more fun than I've ever had writing a book. I'm learning so much, and I can't wait for you all to read it. There's times I'll write something, I think, I cannot wait for our fans to read this. Some of these stories are 100 years old or more. And so you don't know them. And I didn't know them. And there were some things that I had heard a few things about, but when you dig in and actually do your research and you begin to realize, you know, sometimes things that we're told are not actually factual, right? And so I share that with you because um, we're going to open up pre-orders, I think, next month, what they're telling me. Don't have an actual date for pre-orders, but... um, Things are going to sell out quickly for the uh, limited edition, but we're going to have thousands of books. Don't fret. You're going to get a, plenty of opportunities to get this book. But the thing that I sit about and think about sometimes, you know, when I absorb the things that I've learned, is I'm so incredibly proud from where we've come. And that years ago and generations ago and, and decades ago that we had men like Duke Humphrey that said, you know what? Good enough is just not good enough. We want to be great here at Mississippi State. We want to be able to compete at the highest level in every aspect. And rather just sit back and, and, and I'll tell you guys, all due respect to some of those guys, when the state athletic control board was kind of calling the shots, they did us wrong. They did. They just made these hires out of convenience. And then when Duke Humphrey had an opportunity to kind of change the trajectory of things, he did. He did. And he deserves to be remembered, and thankfully he is. And you're going to learn a lot about Duke Humphrey uh, in, in, in the book. But I would encourage you to do your own research and be proud of the leadership because I think it's important to know where we're going to also understand where we're coming from. You know, it's not where you're at, it's where you're coming from. And then the second most important thing is where you're going. You know, we've had to overcome a lot. <clears throat> we've had a lot of people in state government <clears throat> excuse me, for years that uh, were all miseducated and uh, somewhat biased in how they handled things. And so uh, for you Bulldogs that had to endure so much of that, Uh, my hat is off to you. I absolutely respect you. But for those of you that are involved in bully block and that have allowed Mississippi State to have a seat at the table when it's come to state government, you are to be commended, and we don't say thank you enough. If you haven't done so, go to whenthebottomfalls.com. You can get the newest book, When the Bottom Falls, uh, which came out late last year. still doing well. I appreciate all of you that have purchased the book and offered your review to me. And um, if you are somebody that's, that's hurting, whether it be with chemical dependency or substance abuse, or anything in life, I think you'll find some encouragement in that. It's not a vanity project. It's a way for me to try to impart some knowledge to people that uh, that are hurting. It's true. And maybe you're not ready to admit that. But uh, if you know somebody in your life that's in recovery or that needs to be in recovery, or you just kind of want to read a story about uh, you know, kind of the comeback kid, then I encourage you to go read that. And uh, all of my sports titles are there as well. It's Flim Flam, Stark Villains, Alpha Dogs, uh, and Dog Pile, and of course, the remaining qual- quantities of villains and alpha dogs are almost completely exhausted. Uh, we've been in this position before. We are able to get some more, and now that inventory has been depleted. I think every bulldog needs to have those books. It's one of the reasons that I wrote them. And uh, the dude is kind of written in that same vein, kind of out of respect for our history. Uh, and also, too, uh, come join us over at jeanspage.com and uh, come be a part of uh, everything at jeanspage.com. Uh, you'll be glad you did. Offering 50% off the annual subscription price right now. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.